Hello and welcome to EGM 702, Week 4, Part 3, Change Vector Analysis. If we look at these, hopefully by now, quite familiar images of the before and after of the eruption of Mount St. Helens in May of 1980, there are a number of different changes that we can see. For example, we can see new lakes that have formed as a result of the blockage of the river, uh, during the eruption. We also see the very obvious deforestation that happened as a result of the eruption. Uh, but we also can see things like the change in lake color in this reservoir to the south of the mountain as a result of the uh, deposition of volcanic ash onto the lake. And we can also see the changes as a result of the loss of glaciers and snow on top of the mountain going from a very bright white to this sort of tan uh, brownish color uh, that is the volcanic ash. So there's a number of different changes that we can see and if we look at the band differences between the near-infrared and the red bands from these two different images uh, we can start to see those changes here as well. So for example in the near-infrared we see the lake changes represented by a drop in the near-infrared reflectance. We see the snow and glacier loss represented by a drop in the near-infrared and the red reflectance as well. But we can also see uh, the deforestation that has occurred as uh, represented by a, an increase in near-infrared reflectance and an increase in red reflectance. We see the lake changes down here, uh, represented by both an increase in the near-infrared and red reflectances. Um, and we also see the clouds in the image um, off to the west here, uh, represented again by increases in both near-infrared and red reflectance. So all of this is to say that single band differences can be quite difficult to interpret, as we have a number of different signals in our band differences that could come from one or the other or both kind of different changes. So for example the drop in near-infrared reflectance could be because of the uh, formation of the lakes. It could also be as a result of the snow and ice loss. It's very difficult to to tell that just from the near-infrared difference. So if we think about our pixels as representing as, as being represented by vectors where we have the red brightness uh, along the x-axis here and the near-infrared brightness represented along the uh, y-axis here. Uh, we, if we think about these as vectors and think about also the change vector that results, that can help us to uh, interpret these changes more easily. So let's say that we have a vector here that represents a pixel at time 1 and it has a value of 24 in the red band and a value of 100 in the near-infrared. And at time 2, that same pixel now has a slight increase in red reflectance, so it has a value of 36, and a slight decrease in near-infrared, and it has a value of 61. And that difference is also a vector, so we can think about um, we can think about this change as, represent, as being represented by a difference of two different vectors, and we can start to think about um, what this vector, this change vector, represents. And if we think about this vector as having a magnitude, the magnitude represents how much change has happened, and the angle at which this vector uh, points represents or helps us to interpret the kind of change that has happened. Uh, we can also threshold these magnitudes for significance, uh, and we'll look a little bit about that on another slide. Uh, and we can also interpret these angles, or the, the angles of a bunch of different vectors, and start to categorize them uh, as representing different kinds of change. So for example, if we think about the vectors having positive x and positive y components. They're going to sit in the first quadrant here. Uh, vectors having a negative x and a positive y are going to sit in this quadrant here. I believe this is the second quadrant. 
third quadrant is where we have positive x and negative y, and then the, quadrant, the fourth quadrant is where we have negative values in both x and y. So all of this, this, this example that I'm going to uh, work with here, this is a two-dimensional example, but these concepts can all be extended to three, four, as many uh, dimensions as we have image bands and as our computer resources will allow. So if we look at now the differences between the, uh, I've now plotted the pixel values for the near infrared band difference and the red band difference from the Mount St. Helens example, and you can see a number of different features um, or a number of different patterns that start to pop out in this, uh, in this plot. So each of these different points is representing an individual change vector. We can see different clusters or patterns. For example, glacier and snow loss, which was represented by very significant drops in both the near infrared and the red band. We can also see where the new lakes have formed because this is represented by very little change in the red reflectance and a very significant drop in the near infrared reflectance. We can also see the change in lake color represented by an increase or a slight increase in both the red and the near infrared uh, differences. And then we can also see the deforestation represented by significant increases in both of these, um, in both the red and the near infrared bands. If we plot the angle that these vectors make, this is what the result looks like. I've now classified this um, image or displayed it as a classified image so that the um, vectors having two positive components are this orange color, vectors having one negative and one positive, so a negative x, a positive y component are this sort of yellow color, um, this sort of pinkish purpley color is uh, vectors where we have a positive red, uh, positive red and a negative, um, a negative near infrared uh, reflectance change, and then the dark purple is where we have both vector components being negative. So very broadly we have four different categories here. Category 1 uh, is again where we have an increase in the near infrared and an increase in the red reflectance. So this is things like the forest, uh, the deforestation that you can see, the ash fall on cleared areas um, in, the, uh, in the surrounding area, uh, as well as our lake, um, the change in lake color. Um, areas where we have a negative change in the red reflectance and a positive change in the near infrared are mostly to do with cloud shadows, I believe, off to the west. Um, areas where we have a drop in near infrared and an increase in red, um, these are um, areas like mostly just the forests, but then also um, we see some patterns on the lake here that uh, that has filled up. Um, so these are areas where mostly we don't see significant changes from one image to the next. And then finally we have our uh, fourth quadrant where we have drops in both near infrared and red reflectance and this is where we have our lakes and our glacier loss and then also our clouds um, from, the, uh, um, from it, the clouds in the 1980 image. We can also further subdivide this, so rather than taking four different quadrants, we could look at quadrants um, divided up into eight different regions or however many that we feel like we can start to cluster these vectors. Um, these are all different things that we, can, that we can start to work with to try to help us interpret these changes. If we look now at the magnitude of differences between our two images, we see that most of the scene is fairly similar. So most of the uh, images fall within about 41 um, digital number values uh, between the two different dates. So this is sort of our, our low magnitude um, areas where we don't see significant changes. Areas where we see large differences on the other hand, uh, so we've mentioned already the glacier and snow loss on the mountain, 
Uh, we can also see areas where we have clouds in one image uh, that aren't in the other image. We can see the big area of deforestation in front of the glacier, where again we're seeing significant um, or fairly significant differences between the two images. And we can also see uh, areas where we have ash cover, uh, either on the lake here or in some of these cleared areas off to the east of the mountain. So to sum all of this up, uh, change vector analysis provides a very powerful tool for combining and sort of distilling the information that we can see from multiple bands. There's no real limit to the number of bands that we can use. We are mostly limited by the number of bands that our uh, remote sensing system has and our computing resources. Um, the magnitude of the change vector determines or helps us to determine whether a change has actually taken place and the angle of the vector or the direction that it points helps us to interpret what kind of change has happened. So there's a number of different resources here that you can read more about this. Uh, you, chapter 7 of Lillisand, Kiefer, and Chipman, Chapter 12 of Jensen, and I've included a number of different papers on change vector analysis um, on the reading area on Blackboard uh, that you can have a look at uh, to learn a little bit more about this. And in the practical for this week, we will do a, an exercise looking at change vector analysis. That's all I have for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please post them to the discussion board on Blackboard. Thanks. Bye.